Welcome to Myanmar Musings, a podcast of the Myanmar Research Centre at the Australian National University, Canberra. I'm Luke Corbin. It's June 10, 2021, and today we are talking about Facebook, one of the behemoth corporations that is reshaping our world, Myanmar included. In the most recent edition of the Journal of Contemporary Asia, authors Stein Tornison, Min Zor U, and Ne Lin Aung published an article on Facebook use in Myanmar, and particularly the ways in which the platform is being used by nine major armed groups in the country. Our two guests today are authors Stein Tonneson of the Peace Research Institute, Oslo, and Min Zo U from the Myanmar Institute for Peace and Security. Hello to you both. Hello. Nice to be with you. <laughs> so, when I was living in Myanmar, it was an oft-repeated phrase that before the 1st February coup, Facebook was the internet. Before we talk about armed groups and everything, and how Facebook has been used as a tool in Myanmar, I'd like to talk about how the platform has been using Myanmar. It's a bit sinister. So when did Facebook arrive in the country and why and how did it become so popular? Facebook was already installed on uh, the net and on mobile telephones when only less than 1% of the population had mobile phones and when they were extremely expensive. And at that time, Facebook already made a Burmese language version of itself. That was a major advantage. And when then the revolution came, the digital revolution came with the opening in 2013, I suppose that someone in Facebook may have seen this coming and have planned it because they saw that with the political opening, Myanmar would be a coming growth nation. But it's also possible, in my view, that it was more by luck. When people started buying mobiles, they got Facebook with the mobile, and that became their gateway to the internet and has remained since. Uh, the use of Facebook expanded in synchronization with the digital expansions, uh, because a lot of telephone sellers, they install Facebook uh, on, uh, on the telephone. Uh, when they sell the telephone. Uh, that is a pretty much a ubiquitous uh, uh, practice in Myanmar. So people in Myanmar use Facebook uh, not only for connecting friends or, as a social media, but they also use as a web, web browser. So if they want to search something, instead of using Google, uh, they will search in the Facebook. So for a regular Burmese who are not uh, very much savvy on the internet, uh, they would type the search terms in the Facebook search box rather than using Google. And Facebook doesn't publicize this kind of thing, but did either of you, any of you, manage to come up with any estimates of what Facebook's revenue could be from its business operations in Myanmar and what its you know, contribution to tax should have been? if it ever decided to actually pay taxes to the government? I have not really tried to find out. I have asked, but not got any answer. But I would, would guess that Facebook's earnings in Myanmar have been quite substantial by Myanmar standards, and tax paid by Facebook, if tax had been paid, would have been quite important contribution to the state budget of Myanmar. But I don't think that the Myanmar market has yielded so much revenue for Facebook that it really counts for Facebook globally. Uh, Facebook, when it makes decisions concerning Myanmar, it thinks almost just as much about the opinion in the United States and the West uh, as it thinks about the local conditions in Myanmar. That's at least my impression. Let me also emphasize that uh, Facebook has never wanted and never been willing to establish an office inside Myanmar. The whole operation is run from Singapore under a director for emerging APAC countries. So only from time to time do some people come into Myanmar. And this is partly because Facebook doesn't want to put its employees at risk of coming in har getting in harm's way inside Myanmar. It's also because they don't want to be under the influence of the Myanmar state. 
Yeah, the, the practice is uh, different than other uh, Southeast Asian countries. The Vietnamese government also raised a similar issue with tax and other security issues. And Facebook uh, did a very extensive outreach to the Vietnamese government and uh, tried to come up with some solution. But unfortunately, that was not the case with the Myanmar government. Okay. I wonder about revenue in particular, and I asked that question because there have been all of these bannings and removals of undesirable content, and we'll get to talking about all that. But, you know, for example, Commander-in-Chief Min Aung Hlaim used to prolifically post, or someone on his behalf posted on Facebook, and, you know, it used to look like they were being boosted, which means they were being paid for. Facebook has refused to answer how much money it's received from Min Aung Hlaim and various other people that it has subsequently banned for serious, you know, ethical breaches, as it would say. This is a very kind of murky area. Um, Facebook taking action based on, you know, moral concerns, but then not making public any of its of its earnings. For Facebook, it's basically a commercial operation and income comes to some extent from these boostings, but I expect mainly from ads. So the, the size of the Myanmar market has not been enough to really uh, generate the kind of income from ads that you have in more advanced economies. Now, for people outside of Myanmar who perhaps think of Facebook and Myanmar together in a sentence, they're going to think about everything that happened in 2017, 2018. So I'll ask, how do you think the choices that Facebook has made in its operations in Myanmar have made it a part of or responsible for intercommunal civilian conflict, even ethnic cleansing, or even genocide? Facebook has been a medium. Uh, people vent out their opinion, and people try to spread their perspective to their supporters, communicate with their supporters. Uh, in that sense, uh, whenever there's an intercommunal violence, uh, we see spikes of hate speeches, misinformation, disinformation, and that has been a trend even now, right after the coup and now the violence uh, during the coup period. You know, Facebook is serving as a very important platform in spreading all those hate speeches. So yes, Facebook does play a role in that uh, the intercommunal of violence and uh, different types of violence in Myanmar. For Facebook... The most important thing is, from its own perspective, to serve its community and to put friends together. And its algorithms also tend to favor private messages, but also extreme messages, uh, because extreme messages tend to gather many likes and sharings, and then that leads the algorithms in Facebook to boost them uh, and to create what is called echo chambers within groups that harbor the same feelings. And this expressed itself very much in connection with the ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya. Uh, not in 2012, when the first communal uh, violence occurred, because at that time, uh, very few people had access to Facebook or internet at all. But in 2016, to a very great extent. And this... Uh, happened at a time when Facebook was also criticized at home for its role in the US elections, for the Cambridge Analytica scandal, for the Brexit referendum in the United Kingdom. And that led in 2018, a little bit belatedly, Facebook to become much more engaged as an actor. Until then, it had seen itself just as a platform for communication. But when it got all these criticisms, it also started hiring new staff and monitors knowing the languages in Myanmar. And then when the U United Nations Human Rights Council received the report on the ethnic cleansing uh, by the Myanmar military, and after this 
hate campaign that happened during the ethnic cleansing organized to a great extent by people adhering to the Mabata movement. Then Facebook started to apply its banning policy. It banned the monk Uviratu in January 2018. It banned the pages of Mabata in June that year and also two other monks. And in August, it closed down a great many Tatmadaw controlled pages and profiles, including that of Commander-in-Chief Minang Lai, who had, I, I seem to remember, about 2 million uh, followers. And then in 2019, it also banned four armed groups that belonged to a northern alliance so for fighting against the military, the Tatmadaw. So there is a long history of banning and monitoring and closing down and censoring the content before we get to the time of the coup this year, which has accentuated everything to a great extent. Right. And before we talk about the coup explicitly, why don't we focus on armed groups? This is the core of your recently published research how armed groups used Facebook. So which armed groups active in Myanmar did you choose to analyze when you performed your research and why did you choose them? Uh, in Myanmar, uh, we have about 21 active armed groups, but not all of them are actively using the Facebook. So we chose the major groups and among, even among the major groups, some of the armed groups use Facebook very extensively, like the TNLA and AA. Uh, they are very good at using the Facebook. Uh, so we choose uh, major armed groups, and also we also analyze how they use the Facebook. And we also found that not all of them, not all major groups are using Facebook uh, to the same degree. They have a very different degrees of the usage. We um, found that particularly as Min says, uh, some groups were particularly active. One that surprised us a little was the Sa Shan State Army South, which is led by General Yodzerk. They have a whole little Thai freedom empire, well, seemingly well funded and active in many languages. And then there were these two younger groups that Min mentioned, the Arakan Army AA, the very big, with vigorous, relatively young leaders. And the same with the Tang National Liberation Army, Palaung, also with young leaders. They were very, very active. And for them, it was a real backlash when Facebook closed down their accounts in February 2019, just as their alliance was engaging in, uh, or particularly the Arakan army was engaging in a life and death struggle with the Tatmadaw that lasted for two years. In our research, we worked on the armed groups that existed before the coup in Myanmar, where you had many armed groups with names, known leaders, and often operating in uniform. This pattern is different from in many other countries, like for instance, Syria. But after the coup, there has been a change in the pattern of armed conflict in Myanmar. Uh, some groups that did not fight before are now fighting, some groups are not fighting who didn't fight before either. And one group, the Arakan army, has stopped fighting under an informal ceasefire of the government. But the most important change is the creation of small, violent groups among untrained young people with few weapons and who seek training with the ethnic armed groups and want to fight violently against the regime, but without really the means to do so, so far. And they have formed local resistant groups in many, many places. You have a score of them in Yangon, and they do not seem to be coordinated. 
uh, you have new a new group in Chin State called Chinland Force. You have groups that have come up in the big Sagaing region, and you have also a kind of new group among the Kaya in Kaya State. And in your opinion, the main thrusts of your research is that in general, before the first February coup, these armed groups use Facebook to act like states. They use Facebook as a tool for command and control and intelligence, and they use Facebook for international outreach. Could you explain a bit about these? Maybe give us some examples of how this happened from from some of these organizations you've already mentioned. The important thing we found out was that the primary function was communication with the constituents. It's to build up the identity and the support for the organization among their own constituents. Then when they engage in armed operations, the command and control function becomes important. And we are particularly observed that for the Arakan army. The outreach to the international society has not been that much accentuated, but some of the groups have been active there as well, like the RCSS that I mentioned with uh, publications or with postings in many languages. And the Arakan army, perhaps mainly through a particularly astutely and very intelligently made YouTube video called The Way of Rakita, which has played a significant role both in boosting pride among their own constituents and in showing what they think to the wider world. Right, the, another uh, major function, they use Facebook, uh, especially those Facebook Messenger, as a way to share intelligence uh, among uh, their operative. And also there are some, like a close page, they allow people to join so people can share the truth movement of uh, the enemy uh, and also intelligence who could be the spy. So uh, Facebook was serving as a, a tool of the intelligence collection and intelligence operation as well. And during the fighting, not only the uh, American army, even like uh, uh, Myanmar Tamado uh, was using Facebook Messenger to communicate uh, among their troops as well. And how siloed are these armed groups on Facebook? We've mentioned very briefly how algorithms tend to promote more extreme content and keep people in their little boxes. But I wonder, is that what's happening with these or is that what was happening with these armed groups or were supporters and these armed groups, you know, cross posting, talking to one another uh, when uh, armed groups allied together? Did that manifest on Facebook as well as on the battlefield? We find that they speak very little to each other. They speak to themselves primarily. And also this uh, is part of the language diversity in Myanmar. If you look at the largest of all the armed groups, the United Wa State Army, it is not really part of our research because it uses Chinese, Chinese internet and not, is not really on Facebook at all or very, very little present on Facebook. And the same is the case for two other groups that are on the border to China, the Kokang group and the Mongla group. Their discussions on social media are on Chinese social media. And then there are also groups that have their own language, like the Kachin language, which is written with a different alphabet from the Burmese. But in one particular case, the conflict between the Arakan army and the Tatmado, there the two enemies, the two sides, have shared almost the same language because Rakhine and Bamar are so close, so they understand each other without any difficulty. Therefore, you have seen an enormous exchange of hate speech between the Arakan army supporters and the supporters of the Tatmado during the period from 20. Uh, 19, the early 2019, until uh, there was an informal ceasefire just before the elections in November last year. Now that you've brought up alternatives to Facebook, I mean, it is, like we said, a truism, an oft-repeated phrase that in Myanmar, Facebook is the internet. But 
there are these Chinese alternatives for some armed groups. And then when some people, organizations are banned by Facebook in Myanmar, they have turned to alternatives. And you did look at one other platform in particular, which I do not know how to pronounce. Could you introduce and tell us what you found there? Yes, we, we call it just the VK. It's a Russian service and it has a, a position in Russia, but and it has been used by the groups when they are banned. They have switched to VK. Uh, and on VK, they have then uh, reached very few people. So it's been unsuccessful. But then at the same time, they have generated new fake accounts or inauthentic accounts on Facebook, which can then have links to what they put on BK. In that way, they are getting around the ban that they have experienced. Right. And it strikes me something interesting about the way that Facebook is used in Myanmar compared to, um, what would you say, Facebook's more mature markets is that in countries like, for example, the United States, there is this push for authentication and for using your real identity on Facebook. You know, that's very important to Facebook and other huge internet corporations now. But in Myanmar, it's very much anonymized and free for all for normal accounts. And most average Burmese people have more than one Facebook account. So do you think that this is something that affects the way that Facebook is used in Myanmar compared to other places? In, in Myanmar, uh, many people uh, have more than one account. Uh, one is for political reasons, uh, the security reason, others are for social reasons. If, since the Facebook become the internet, uh, there are the groups uh, that people don't want to join with their real account. So they use the fake accounts to join. Sometimes people use fake account to post the disinformation and misinformation. That's that's a very much a ubiquitous. Nowadays, uh, you will see that the, all the fake news are uh, spread or started from the, those fake accounts. So in Myanmar, uh, having more than one account becomes a lifestyle and also a part of the political culture as well. It's, it's also a means of protection. We have seen, for instance, that women engaging in fighting uh, gendered violence and also members of the LGBT community who link up with Facebook, they protect themselves through inauthentic or fake identities. But in principle, this is against Facebook's community standards also for Myanmar. Uh, and in fact, that has had also one effect on Facebook's banning. Because when it bans a group or if when it removes an account, takes down all the content and just takes it away, uh, then it's easy for it to say that this is because it's inauthentic because that's a break of its community standards enough to be closed down. The real reasons may be other. It's the simplest and the most convenient way for Facebook to take action on its own terms. Exactly, when it feels that that is needed. These community standards are kind of legislation, you may say, within the Facebook community. But it's not as precise as national laws are normally. They are quite vague so that it's relatively easy to say that something is against this or another point in the community standards and then remove accounts. Uh, this, this leads us to say something about the way that uh, Facebook monitors and decides on what to remove. This was uh, surprising to me, the methods that Facebook seemed to use, because they rely very much on automatic uh, program software, which is called artificial intelligence, but actually does not, in my view, deserve the, the term intelligence because it's more mechanic. This means that Facebook is very good at removing 
a lot of undesirable stuff if it contains a certain string of text or a certain image that has already been identified as uh, unacceptable, such as, for instance, a bare breast or a particular cartoon, because the software will immediately recognize it and remove it. And if the software reaches something that may be doubtful, it sends it to monitors and these monitors will then receive a great number of reports on diverse issues that they have to handle one at a time in a very short time in order not to lose any time and to make it profitable for Facebook. What is lacking here is human intelligence that selects certain pages or accounts for being scrutinized over a period on the basis of knowledge of context in the way that traditional intelligence services are working. So the result of this system is that we see Facebook constantly fail to remove stuff when they meet the intelligence of their users. This is something we have also in our project tried to follow. We have, for instance, looked at how extremely long it takes Facebook to get to removing uh, something they have not seen before. Uh, And we have seen that in egregious cases where with uh, videos of uh, killings, dead bodies and so on that have remained and been shared on Facebook for a long time, although they obviously are against the community standards. Yes, uh, that issue is more prevalence in misinformation and disinformation. So when it happened, like for example, like I also have a personal experience, somebody posted uh, misinformation about me on the Facebook by using a fake account. So I reported to the Facebook that by the time Facebook finished review, it's already spread to hundreds of thousands of users. So by the time Facebook decided to take it down, then people took a screenshot of the post and continue sharing the post without having the original links. So this is one of the examples how Facebook failed to deter misinformation and disinformation uh, on the Myanmar context, at least. Right, it's interesting and, and quite complicated. But one thing um, that comes to mind is that when Facebook bans a official serious account, then it has huge um, practical and symbolic value. So I wonder about Myanmar society and politics more generally. What impact did it have in Myanmar when Facebook chose to close down certain accounts, like, for example, Mabata in 2018, um, Minong Hlaing, parts of the Tatmadaw, the Northern Alliance, and then what's happened after the coup? The Facebook, the uh, the exercise of the community standards of taking down uh, those profiles is more effective against the Mabata, uh, more effective against the Tamador uh, spread of propaganda than the other way around. For example, like the Facebook, uh, when Facebook tried to ban the Arakan army, the Arakan army was pretty easy to walk around by using a lot of proxy account to uh, reach out to their constituencies. Uh, but like the Mabata, uh, during one of our interviews, the Mabata uh, leaders uh, also mentioned that it did affect them, uh, especially when it came to like uh, uh, fundraising and also uh, reaching out to their people of their activities. So that that's so there has been effect, but in, in make different impacts from one group to another. Okay, and then to turn the tables around, Facebook has been banned in Myanmar. How do you see it? affecting the future of political participation, organizing, um, resistance to the Tatmadaw, and, you know, the fact that Facebook is banned now, what have the consequences been for armed groups and the way armed groups are using Facebook? My impression is that this declaration of a ban of Facebook didn't work at all because my contacts in Myanmar have continued to use Facebook all the time. 
and have been able to an astounding extent to use VPN to get around uh, the bans. The shutdowns of the internet were somewhat more harming. So for during certain intervals when the, in, the internet was shut down, there was less communication. But Facebook remains the dominant uh, means of communication for the dominant social media and internet gateway in Myanmar, even today, several months after the coup and several months after the military junta declared its ban against Facebook and other applications. Yes, uh, despite the ban of the Facebook, uh, Burmese people managed to use VPN to easily uh, bypass the ban to reach to the Facebook, even though there may be some decline in the Facebook uh, use, number of Facebook users, but the Facebook remain the uh, dominant uh, social media platform. But what is significantly hard uh, could be the Facebook revenue. Uh, because of the ban, the, uh, the social media influencers have almost stopped working uh, this is what we realized. This is where usually a lot of these uh, advertising activities were going on. So after the coup, the social media influencers uh, stopped uh, working their functions for two reasons. Number, number one reason was after the coup, that a lot of people uh, regard that any activities rather than revolution uh, is an insult. So if you're posting a picture with a beautiful dress, that people will come and criticize you and why you're having a good time, why other people are fighting the regime. So the, a lot of social media influencers the, uh, stop uh, posting all those fancy posts and that also associated with a lot of advertising activities. So that definitely uh, went down. But the overall, uh, the Facebook use, the Facebook remained the dominant platform. Hmm. It, is, it is a paradox that this has happened because in a way, Facebook and the current re military regime in uh, Myanmar have banned each other, but still they are both there operating. And the Tatmado, the military regime, is also using Facebook for spreading its messages. Less effectively, I would say, than the uh, opponents and democracy movement, but still, I think that the fact that the military government is so far at least obliged to accept that Facebook plays this role is quite interesting. Facebook, by the way, was rather quick after the coup to take a stand. On the 11th of February, 10 days after or 11 days after the coup, they came with their first declaration where they said that they would prevent online content from being linked to offline harm, and they would protect freedom of expression, and they would do their best to make sure that Facebook stay online. On 24th February, uh, Facebook went out from its office in Singapore and said that the coup greatly increases the danger posed by the behaviors uh, undesirable behaviors and the likelihood that online threats could lead to offline harm. And they said they, they closed down the accounts of the military news service and also several other accounts that had come up since the ban in 2018. And on the 31st of March, Facebook introduced a new safety match method feature where people could close down their accounts so that only friends could see what they were posting in order for people to be more safe in the new, very dangerous environment that Myanmar has entered into. And then on the 14th of April, Facebook said that it now would do its best to remove praise, support and advocacy for violence. Uh, and this has become essential now when uh, the peaceful protest movement has moved into a new phase with more active violence because now Facebook is being used a lot for praising, supporting and advocating violence. 
So it's a big challenge for Facebook to try to live up to its promise of 14th April and be able to detect such praise and support and advocacy and remove it. And now that Facebook has finally become firmly politicised, and that was a fantastic um, summary that you just gave then since the coup from Facebook's side, maybe Minzo U, how has the State Administration Council couched its language talking about the Facebook ban? Uh, and as Stein has said, they are still using Facebook, even though it's banned. Um, does it say something for a Tatmadaw sympathizer to continue using Facebook? Does it mean something? Or are they all doing it? Is it all just for show? Well, the sense of, yeah, the sense of Facebook is the main social media platform. Uh, the Tatmadaw and its supporters continue using Facebook. But there were also plans uh, being discussed uh, but not being implemented yet. That is... Uh, the Myanmar were eventually having a whitelist firewall. Instead of having a blacklist, that was uh, that was easily bypassed by the VPN. Uh, they will have a whitelist, and they will prevent outgoing traffic to any seat uh, that is not the part of the whitelist. So uh, we also heard the news that the VK is now trying to put a, a stronger foothold in Myanmar uh, in this regard. If there's a whitelist firewall, then uh, Myanmar people would need other alternative uh, social media platforms. And so BK could be the one. It strikes me that Facebook's legacy in Myanmar has received, in the West at least, a boost now that it is not the tool of genocide. It is now the tool of resistance. So what do you think of the legacy of Facebook since its introduction in Myanmar to today, and what do you think about its future? Uh, Facebook has played a very extensive role in the recent uh, uprising uh, against a military coup. Uh, so the whole movement was pretty much organized uh, through the Facebook. Uh, then now that uh, nonviolent movement it transformed into uh, violent resistance, and the Facebook is still playing a major role. Uh, we notice that Facebook has now become a platform for targeted killings in Myanmar. There are pages on the Facebook uh, that the uh, those uh, fighters or their supporters post, uh, who are the collaborators of the regimes that need to be targeted. And so far, we saw about fifty to eighty per eighty people were already killed. Usually, those target selections are made uh, among the operatives. And when they make the selections, uh, the local intelligence, like uh, some local people, the operative in the local, and also that kind of Facebook pages posted also help them uh, to locate and identify uh, who the person is, who the person is to be targeted. Uh, another function that Facebook serves in uh, targeted killing is uh, cheerleading. So when somebody posted a uh, news or a post saying that, okay, uh, so-and-so person, so-and-so what a minister was killed this morning, then you're going to see a lot of comments underneath praising the actions. Oh, yeah, he's deserved to die. And there were some like a hidden languages like, uh, oh, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, somebody give them dumbbell. Dumbbell is a biryani. Uh, dumbbell, giving dumbbell, offering dumbbell in slang means kill. He should be killed. Uh, mm -hmm. So then you're going to see a lot of that kind of comments uh, underneath the post to justify uh, that, uh, that the people are cheering them, uh, that kind of actions are something justifiable, something worthy to do. And the Facebook uh, now become a, a, a platform for targeted killing. On the other hand, the regime is using the Facebook as an intelligence collection platforms. And for example, like if uh, somebody is going from Yangon to Nepido, uh, when security forces come to the car like to search, they were asked to present the telephone and actually open uh, the Facebook account. So they will go through the Facebook account and see whether uh, any anti-government activities have been posted. 
So uh, the Facebook is now become the intelligence collection platform, but also, on the other hand, the resistant forces are using uh, Facebook for targeted killings and also the intelligence sharing and organizing the operation as well. The Reuters agency put together a very interesting article a month ago about surveillance software that had been bought in Myanmar already before the coup and which the telecom providers have been obliged to by the gov military government to allow. So this software can probably be used intelligently to target arrests and raids and other abuse at the same time as the people's defense forces, as they are called, are organizing every here and there and using Facebook to uh, denounce informers who are then subsequently uh, killed. This, this will uh, seems to be the new trend now. And it reminds me of a very interesting research that was done on social media in the conflict in Syria. In the periods when the internet was shut down by the Assad regime in Syria, violence was blind. Many civilians were killed, and it was not necessarily the people who threatened the regime most who were killed. But in the periods when the, when the internet was up, then the numbers of people killed went down, but those who were killed were individuals who had been targeted on the basis of their communication on the internet. So I think that the cyber warfare is now taking off for real in Myanmar. So far, the cyber war, to the extent that it has happened, has mainly been dominated by the resistance against the coup, but that could quickly turn. And then the question is what the telecom providers and Facebook do about that. It's clearly both what the, uh, the targeted killings by the, by the resistance movement and the targeted violence by the uh, regime are against Facebook community standards. So what the Facebook is in a terrible dilemma. Given everything we've said today, um, you know, Facebook is responsible for a lot of good in the world and has um, had a lot of positive impacts on Myanmar society as well. But there's a lot about Facebook that, in my opinion, is still a little bit evil that we haven't touched on today. So I wonder, do you, after your research, do the two of you still use Facebook? And if so, how do you do it? For me, I use an anonymous profile and I try not to put much of my personal information on there. But I know that that runs counter to a lot of other people. So how do you guys use Facebook if you do? Uh, I remain using Facebook. Uh, simply to read news, what people are posting, what is going on. I, I rarely post things after the coup anymore. So Facebook uh, nowadays is mostly for me is to collect information. I love Facebook. I use it for publishing my views and my news about my research and reach many people I would not reach if I didn't use Facebook for that purpose. I also use it sometimes for personal matters. And I must say that the role that Facebook had for me when my parents died, and I received all the messages from people who had known my parents at some time in their uh, life, was ex emotionally extremely important to me. I also remember how I suffered when I was suddenly once removed from Facebook and everything I had put on Facebook had instantly disappeared and I didn't know why. And it took me a few months to get it back uh, with great difficulty. Also, if I didn't use Facebook in various ways, I would be less qualified for doing the kind of research that I have been engaged in with Min and Nelin in Myanmar. So I will continue using Facebook. And I have also must must say, I somewhat appreciated the attempt that Facebook has made to make a stand against the coup and the junta in Myanmar. Excellent. 
Um, before we wrap up, Stein and Minzo, do you have any uh, recommendations for our listeners? Any Facebook pages that you might want to direct them to? They can look at our project um, Facebook page. And there are many Facebook users in Myanmar who post news very intelligently. So just be very careful about picking the people you follow so that you get accurate information. And try to diversify. Myanmar is dangerously depending on Facebook. So try to familiarize yourself also with other social media and also more uh, sources like, for instance, Wikipedia, Quora, and those who are more factual. Yes, uh, I will echo a state that in Myanmar, you can't never follow a single source or single type of source to know the truth, what is going on inside the country. You have to diversify from different outlooks and uh, not only different views, but also from different groups to actually capture what is going on. Uh, Facebook algorithm is very powerful in repeating the echo chambers. So uh, I, I observed some cases like when somebody spread rumors that is picked up and that become uh, uh, actual news. So uh, it's very important to diversify the source to explore what is happening inside the country. Excellent advice there. This has been a really interesting, really stimulating conversation. I've enjoyed it very much. And I really appreciate both of you coming on to Myanmar Musings from two other time zones, Europe and the United States. So thank you so much, Stein and Minzo U. Thank you very much. Thank you. And have a good night.